Some of you I haven't seen in a bit, and yes, I cut my hair. So this is the, this is the second week of the haircut. It's still here. And uh, yes, and uh, it died the death of a thousand cuts. And and I am uh, I'm signaling change. Just signaling change. Things are going to change. Things are going to change. I, I need to change. Things are going to change. Um, you, you ever gotten yourself where you had your plan set? You always have. You get your plan set. But listen, we don't belong to ourselves. We belong to the Lord. And he can unsettle us and move us and change us. And, and uh, all my heroes are people that are in their 80s doing ministry. So I'm planning on, on uh, doing something unto Jesus as long as I got breath in my body. And I'm ready for all the change that he has. Bring it. Amen. Because I said yes. I said yes. I, have you said yes? yes? All right. We're people who said yes. And can you believe in God's future for you? Yes. Yeah. Now, here's what will happen. First time, first time the first taste of change comes, you get mad, angry, and depressed. Come on. Yes. Come on. We do. We get, yeah. Come on. We do. And then we start remembering our own story and we realize that God has been with us. I was thinking about changing my sermon to Abraham this morning, but I'm not changing it to Abraham. Uh, I'm changing it to something else. (laughs) But hey, listen, a little generosity will push us over the edge. Will you help out? Are you for, did you say yes? yes? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for people who are generous a family who's open, a family who wants the future to come, a family who believes in your future for us, a family, Lord, who knows that we are following you and your voice and your heart and your love, and we are safe in your love. Blessed be the name of Jesus, and everyone said? Amen. Amen. You can be seated. I have a lot to give, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take off while they're passing buckets. I'm going to do something I've never done before today. I didn't do it last night. I did it a little bit. I'm doing it all the way today. I'm going to tell you the story of one pastor in his church. And I'm going to tell you uh, a large portion of the story. We actually have a little more than I'm going to tell you. But I'm going to do it in a a way where the, the big focus is the word of God, period. So this morning, if I'm successful, you get more words from the apostle than from the pastor, from that apostle than this pastor. I'm going to talk to you about apostle, pastor, father, and his people, the the church of Thessalonica born and how it, and how it thrives. And this is uh, this is, this is for you this morning because listen, God wants to speak to you. And so what I'm going to say is, as you're receiving this word this morning, it's going to be a vast, sprawling word with a number of subjects in it. There's a subject in this word for you. There's a word in this word for you. You got to get your word. In 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 the times of the Apostle Paul, the people had only their Old Testaments. And of course, they didn't have their own copies. They had only the oral word given in their public readings and worship. And they had their life in the Holy Spirit. And their whole Bible was, at this time, this church, their whole Bible is going to be the letter that Paul sends them. So let's dive in. Acts chapter 17, verse 1. This is how Thessalonica received Christ. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. Say Thessalonica. There was a synagogue of the Jews and Paul went in as was his custom. He's a rabbi. He has the right to go in. He can teach in the synagogue. And on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. And it says he was explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead saying, this Jesus 
whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. Now, remember, this is Luke writing in Acts. This passage right here sounds exactly like Luke 24, where Luke tells us that Jesus told them the scriptures concerning himself, how he must suffer and rise from the dead. And this was when they had not seen that in the scriptures. So now Paul is going to Thessalonica and giving them something they had not seen in their scriptures. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, and did a, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. This is, the, this is, the, this is now the formation of the church. It was formed from synagogue Jews who were convinced by Paul, and some devout Greeks, that means Greeks who were in the synagogue, who were God-fearers, but not yet converted to Judaism. And then he adds, and not a few of the leading women. I love this text. Now, on this week, 19 years ago, I stood up in my Baptist church and I said to them, I'm about to preach a message to you that will change our lives forever. I said to them, I've preached many message to, messages to you, but I've never known for certain, like I know today, that what I was going to give them would change us forever. Three weeks later, I was out of the church. It's true. Paul knows when he goes to a synagogue that he's about to deliver a message to them and it will change everything forever. I didn't do much different than Paul. All I did was preach to my church things that were in their scriptures that had not been clearly seen and had not been walked out and lived out and said to them, these things are now fulfilled in your sight. Paul just goes in and he, and, he, and he tells them about Jesus from their own scriptures. But the Jews were jealous and taking some wicked men of the rabble, nothing like that happened to me, they, they formed a mob and set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, which we're not introduced to Jason in this text. We're just, this is presumptuously given to us, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men have turned the world upside down. And they have come here also. And Jason has received them. Ah, and to as many as received him, he gave them the power to become the sons of God. Now Jason has received them and all are acting against the decrees of Caesar saying there is another king, Jesus. Now notice this, go back. This Jesus who I proclaim to you is the what? In that word, they were saying he's the king. So this is not a false accusation. It's just been politicized and escalated in order to get the civil authorities to come along beside them and create a, create a problem. And the people in the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as a security from Jason... And the rest, they let them go. So they put them under a bond and, and let them go. Now look what happens. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. Where, and, and, and when they arrived, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now you, if you study Paul, here's what you're going to learn. He went, he'd go to a place. They would stone him. They would beat him. They would run him out of town. He would go to the next town. He would do it again. I used to say to my church, I don't say it so much anymore, but still true. If you fire me today, I'm going to go start over tomorrow. Because I know where, who I'm serving. I know who I belong to. I know what I'm about. But, but Paul, Paul did that, and he did it at great cost and with great pain. Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and they received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them, therefore, believed, and not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. Again, you notice the Greek women of high standing and some men. 
It's, I think it's very powerful to, to note how significant the role of women was in the founding of, of the, our faith. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Now, if you read the passage before, you see that Paul was at Philippi. He goes then to Thessalonica, Berea, and if you read the next passage, he's headed to Athens. Now, I say those things because all of that will be mentioned in the next part that I'm going to take you to. So what happened? Again, what we're given is Paul goes and he reasons for three Sabbaths. It's not very long. But it's long enough to get him, get him kicked out of the synagogue, persecuted by the civil authorities, and to have a new group formed in fashion, a group of Jews, Gentiles, Owen leading women, constituting a new assembly, a new people, a new church. It's still in my heart to plant churches. Um, I, I, I made the announcement last week that our school of church planting is not gonna happen this year. The favor of God's not on it in enough of a way that we can see it, that, it, that, it's, um, that it justifies putting the manpower and money into it that we have to put into it. But the plans uh, don't change, and, and my sense of what God wants me to be involved with doesn't change. And um, so we'll just see. We'll see what God does. I mean, we'll just, we'll, I mean, do you understand? So here's what happens next. I'm taking you to 1 Thessalonians. And if you have a Bible, you can open your Bible this morning because I'm going to be planted in this one small letter. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you by simply reading the scriptures what happened and what it led to. And, uh, and this is a pattern for how to do church life. It's a pattern for every one of you. It's a pattern for how to be the church. So now listen, please don't define church in a limited way to what we do. You are the church and you are in the world being the church. But the things that are in this text will always be true in churches. These things are going to happen. So he, said, he writes to them, Paul Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God all for, for you all, uh, always for you all, constantly mentioning you in our prayers. Remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness and hope. Say faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, love. There it is right there in our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I remember your faith. That's where you start off. And he says, your love. He says, faith, love, and hope. Your love, which is, you can't deviate from that. And your hope, which in Paul has nothing to do with um, hoping that something good happens. It has everything to do with the steadfast assurance that where you're going to end up is where you need to be. And you're safe. And you're in good hands. So he greets them. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that God has chosen you because the gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and the Holy Spirit with full conviction. How do you know God has chosen you? Because the word of God came to you with power and conviction and the Holy Spirit. See, lots of people hear the word, but only those to whom it comes with power and conviction receive the word. And that constitutes those are who, the, who are the elect in Christ. Stop trying to figure it out, just be it. Don't figure that one out. And then he says, um, you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. This is a man who says, we preach not ourselves, but Christ and him crucified. But he has no hesitation to say, who I am validates what I said. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. 
and you receive the word with much affliction and with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. So he says, you saw us, you imitated us, they saw you, they became like you. This is how this thing is done. This is how this thing is done. It's not done any other way. The gospel is done by caught. The, do, the gospel is, is done by follow me. The, come on, let's go. Let's just go. Come go with me. The, you're, you're the gospel. You're the demonstration of the gospel. You're the proof. You're the evidence. I told him again this week. I went to a global school, had 150 students. Um, to be honest with you, when I got there, I was, I was tired and kind of depressed and grumpy, which is a normal description of me. And I stood up in front of them and began to speak. And all of a sudden I was energetic and joyful and ready to conquer the world. And the anointing came. So listen, if you're in a, if you're in a grump, tell the Jesus story. Get over yourself. Strengthen yourself in the Lord. The way you strengthen yourself is by just telling who he is to you, what he's done for you. The joy will come, the strength will come, the power will come. They're all asking about you, Adam and Dara. They're all want to know. What about, what about that, that baby? They're all asking about you, Emma. They all want to know. How's our children? They're all mad at me over there because they say, you keep stealing our best people. I'm like, I'm not done yet. It's an aside. But listen, Ministry is imitate me, imitate me, imitate me. You want to know how to follow Jesus? Go hang out with this dude. You'll get tired, but you'll learn a lot. I'm serious. I'm still in the deal. I'm the, you and me, we're the only proof they're going to get that God is real. And I'm audacious. I still want to say this. How do you know God exists? Because I exist. I'm the evidence. I'm the proof. Come on, let's don't even be messing around. Does, does that mean we're preaching we're perfect? Are you kidding? Nobody does that. That's dumb. I'm not, I'm not perfect, but I'm real. And I am what I am by the grace of God. And I'm alive in him and he's alive in me. You became the example. So he talked to them concerning their witness. Now he talks to them concerning idols. Idols in America are, are unique because in the history of the world, in the Western world, here's what we did. We took the names off our idols and adopted their ways. We're not like the Greeks and Romans. We don't name all our idols. We actually took their names away and adopted and imitated their ways. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere. So Paul says, I'm hearing rumors about you. So we don't need to say anything for they themselves report concerning the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned from idols to serve the living and true God. The early Christians were often called atheists because the early Christians wouldn't go to the pagan celebrations. And neither will I. Not as a participant. Let me say it again. In the, in the ancient world, there were idols everywhere and they had parties for all their gods. And the early Christians quit going to the, to the celebrations of the idols and so they were accused of being atheists. How fascinating is that? You turned from... How you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Jesus, who delivers us from the coming wrath. What a word. For you know yourselves, brothers, how our coming to you was not in vain. Hallelujah. That's the life you want. It was not in vain, Errol. Not in vain, Dan Gross. Not in vain. Our coming to them is not in vain. It's not in vain, Anthony Hawkins. You getting this? It's not in vain, Ryan. It's not in vain. You got it. You getting this stuff? Our coming to you was not in vain. Now, how do you know? Because he had fruit. 
For though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, and that's in Acts, we had the boldness in our God to declare the gospel in the midst of much conflict. Paul got encouraged by the opposition. For our appeal does not spring from error and impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please men, but to please God who tests our hearts. Who? You want to have your heart tested? It'll be tested. It'll be tested by discouragement, by pain, by fear, by frustration, by the idols of this world, by the philosophies of man, by, by the lies, by the temptations, by the shame you feel when you fall on your face. It'll be tested over and over and over again. And I'm just standing up here to say, come on, we can make it. For our appeal does not spring from error and purity. See? Not to please man, but to please God, who tests our hearts. Who tests our hearts. What is your test? It's your future testimony. He tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, or with a pretext for greed. God is our witness. He must have been a y whammer. Youth without any money. <laughs> Nor do we seek glory from people, whether from you or others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. Nothing will test you more than... Um, than than the temptation to be honored and to be willing to not be honored. And then I love this concerning the ministry. First example of ministry is motherhood. Whew. I had uh, I had lunch with uh, with Tom and Lauren and Tiger, their baby. And um, two years ago, Tom was a priest in the Catholic Church. Now he's married to Laura and they have a baby. A few changes in his life. Now he's overseeing a global school. And, and Lauren was at the age of life where babies weren't on the horizon. They were in the other horizon. <laughs> and they got married and have a baby. And I'm sitting with them at lunch and I'm watching Lauren with her, with her baby, with her son. And I'm watching the absolute joyful devotion of a mother to a child. And I'm thinking how tethered she is to that child and how all of the things that she thought would constitute her freedom are gone. So get this, hold of this. You wanna do ministry for Jesus? You're not free anymore. You're tethered to God's children. There has to, love has to have an object. And he says, but we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. And so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our own selves because you'd become dear to us. Wait a minute, you were there for three weeks. Oh yeah, I was there for three days this week. And um, by yesterday when I got home, I've already received contact from six people Every one of them saying, come be with us. Come help us. Houston, San Antonio, Ohio, Hawaii. The nations, there was 12 nations represented where I was teaching this week. And I remember the, the African-American man, because I, I noticed how, mixed, how many, how many dark, dark skinned people there were in the, in the crowd this year. And, and one African-American man came up to me and he said, you know, I'm the, I'm, the, I'm, the only, I'm the only man in my race that, that, that has received this renewal. And I need to know how to do a church and how to function in this renewal. I want you to come help me. And I said, wait a minute, man, there's, there's dark skin everywhere in this crowd. He said, they're Africans. <laughs> he 
He said, I'm the, he said, I'm the only African-American here. <laughs> it was interesting. But he was saying, come and help me. And how did it happen? Three days, they became dear to me. My emotions are raw with it. My new son from Mississippi rings my phone yesterday. Help me, pastor. You're not free anymore. Yeah, started a home group, and now you're responsible for a bunch of people. You know them better than I do. They love you more than they love me, and I'm glad. (laughs) And you're tethered to them. You're a mother. And you're a father. You remember, brothers, our labor, toil, we work day and night. That we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. He's talking about his self-sufficiency. And that was how the Lord had him functioning. Even though it was not required of him, it was what he chose. You were witnesses of God. How holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. You are the witness. You know how I was like a father with his children. You want to know how to be a father? We exhorted each of you. We encouraged each of you. And we charged you. Notice this. He exhorted and encouraged. And then he went, hey. (laughs) Then he got a little stronger. He commanded. To walk in a manner worthy of God. Who calls you into his own kingdom and his glory. You're called to serve a kingdom that's not of this world. You're in the world and you're supposed to be in this world, but you're not of this world. You don't belong to the ways of this world. Never has there been a time that I've ever seen in my life when the ways of the world are swallowing the church like they are just now. Let it happen. In the midst of it all, the glory of God will come and he'll do something great that we've never dreamed of and never seen before. Concerning suffering and judgment, And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you receive the word of the Lord, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it really was, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. Now listen, Paul's saying, what we came and taught you was not the word of men, but of God. You received our gospel. This is to say that the word of God is the gospel preached as well as the Bible, read. I'm reading to you the word of God, but when Jesus is proclaimed, it's the word of God and people receive it. That didn't come from men, that came from God. The word of God, which is at work in you believers. It's at work in you. It's working in you. It's working in you. His word is working in you. It's working in you, John. It's working in you. It's been working in you for years. It's going to do its work in you. For you know, brothers, you became imitators of the churches of God in Christ that are in Judea. See, he's back on to that thing of the only way to, be, to make disciples is to be a disciple. And people follow you and they do what you do. You suffer the same things from our own countrymen that they did from the Jews The ones who killed both the Lord and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and oppose all mankind. Paul was not that inclusive, was he? He didn't say everything's okay. By hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So as always fill up the measure of their own sins, but the wrath that has come upon them at last. But since we were torn away from you, brothers, ah, in a... For a short time in person, but not in heart. I saw a photo of Stephen Robert Carlson and the people they served the Lord with in our, in our other church. They were among four or five couples who were overseeing the youth. And um, let me tell you, they weren't really torn away from them, but let me tell you when, you, when you get back with the people that you've been in the bond of service with, nothing's changed. You pick right back up where you left off and the love you bear them is unbelievable and the way you care about them is unbelievable. And my heart, you can't imagine how my heart still goes to 
you pour a Mississippi in Jacksonville, Florida, and Knoxville, Tennessee, and across this city, your heart just is always on people that you've loved. And if you've ever loved them once, you, you love them still. Endeavoring all the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face. Because we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, I wanted to come again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope, our joy, our crown, our boasting before the Lord Jesus at his coming? It's you. It's you. For you're our glory and our joy. You're our glory and our joy. 1977, I, I was uh, wanting to be licensed to preach the gospel. 1977, I, I went to Hillcrest Baptist Church on a Sunday night. And I said, my sermon tonight is about how to have an abundant life. And I preached on being a mother and a father. And that once you've been a mother and a father, you got some kids. And then you watch your kids grow. And your kids become your joy and your crown. And that's the abundant life. The abundant life is the invested life. The life that's sunk into somebody else's success. Come on, Ethan. It's for you, man. It's sunk into people's lives so that you're bound to them forever. You're going to be like seed, Malia. Y'all are blown in the wind and you're going to bear much fruit and your fruit is going to remain and God's going to blow you again to another place. He's not even near done with you. For what is our hope, our joy, our crown, our boasting for the Lord Jesus at his coming? You will always be my boasting before the Lord. You will always be my joy in the Lord. And that you stand fast means everything. Nothing hurts me more than fallen children. And I want to say, get up, child. Breathe again. Live again. Come on, we have to go. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, because listen, they didn't have text messaging or even telephones or telegraphs. They were thrown away. And so Paul said, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone and we sent Timothy. We just said, Timothy, we have to know what's going on in this. You got to go, man. You got to go. Our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ to establish and exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by these afflictions for you yourself know that we were destined for this. The tortures of serving the Lord in the 21st century are not so much in the Western world tortures of the body, they're tortures of the mind, but they're tortures nonetheless. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this, but when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that, that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. This is a constant theme in Paul's letters. He's always afraid what happened to the seed I sowed. And so if you read his letters, whether it's Philippi, Thessalonica, uh, everywhere he's been, he's constantly says, go, go, go see them and bring me word. Go see them and tell me, tell me about the saints there. And this is why when I go to... Uh, to Harrisburg or when I go to anywhere else to serve, I always, one of the things I always say is I bring you greetings from the saints in God who are in Albuquerque, New Mexico, who have you in their hearts because you don't send your pastor for nothing, but for an investment. I could bear it no longer. I sent to learn about your faith, lest it be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith, you know the good news starts? The good news starts as the good news of what Christ has done and now the good news has progressed to the good news of their faith. The good news of your faith, Jeff, that you're gonna take over to Arizona with you, man, as the Lord sends you over there. The good news of, of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and our affliction, we've been comforted about you through faith. And then listen to what he says. Now we live because you're standing fast in the Lord. Hallelujah. You hear Mama Heidi saying, her life is the faithful, converted people of the northern provinces of Mozambique who once 
had followed a folk Islam and now are following Christ. But now we really live if you are standing in the Lord when the troubles come. That's the abundant life. The abundant life is the connected life to those who are connected to him and the news that their connection to him and to you is not in vain. We're always connected. We're always bound to one another. We belong to one another forever. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before God as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see your face, see you face to face and supply what's lacking in your faith. I've been watching this precious woman of mine that I'm married to. Y'all know I preach about her all the time, don't you? Everywhere I go, they always go, we want to meet Gail. They do. But I can tell you what's happened to, to Miss Gail. She went from being a pastor's wife to a mother of God, a mother in the faith. And you want to see her happy? Let her be squirreled away in her office with two or three people, strengthening them in the Lord. And she's like all alive. Why? Because she's supplying what's lacking in their faith. You're coming along and you're going through the financial difficulties and the relational difficulties and the childbearing difficulties and the, the troubles of life. And somebody say, no, 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 you're fine. You're fine. Here's how where I was. Here's how I got through. Here's what the Lord says. Here's what he does in his people. Here's how it's going to work for you. The invested life. You got to have an investment in this life. And it can't be in a bank. It has to be in people. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy we feel for your sake before our God as we pray most earnestly night and day that we might see you face to face. How many times has he come at this? I want that face to face thing to supply what's lacking. Now may the God and Father himself of our Lord Jesus direct you. So he just, look, here's what happens. He just stops and he says, wait, and he just blesses them. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ for all the saints. He just breaks out into a blessing. I'll say it again. I say this more and more everywhere I go. Whatever you bless increases. Bless the right things. You're made in the image of God. God's image bearers can bless everything. It'll increase. If you bless something that's wrong, it'll still increase. Care about what you bless. Finally, then, brothers. Now he, now he gets, now, now comes the father hat. We ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk is to please God just as you're doing so that you do so more and more. For you know what instruction we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Now, Paul, he's tuning their ears now. He says, listen, I'm giving you something straight from Jesus. I didn't make this up. And he doubles down on it. For this is, for you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. He's doubling down from when he said, we urge you in the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. So here's a charge to you. You got to figure out what sexual morality is. And you got to do it in the world you're living in right now. That each of you know how to control his own body. So we know it involves controlling ourselves in holiness and honor. Not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Yes, there are people who don't know God. That no one transgress and wrong his brother in this manner. Nothing hurt me more when I came to know Jesus than to realize the way I had transgressed the Lord in this sin. There's been no thing in my life that troubled me more than the old memories of this. Because the Lord is an avenger of all these things as we told you. People don't like to see this, but it's right there. People, you know, people don't ever talk about this. The Lord is an avenger of our bad behavior. It's right there. As we told you beforehand, we solemnly warn you, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Now look what he says next, because it's remarkable. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not, not man, but God. To reject, to reject God's teaching on sexual immorality is to reject not man, 
but God. And then he says this wonderful thing, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. God's plan for sexual morality is to fill us with the Holy Spirit and for us to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. There's fruit of the Spirit and there's gifts of the Spirit. When I was in the evangelical world, they were really strong on fruit, not so much on gifts. We're really strong on gifts and we need to revive our interest in in fruit. And the last fruit of the Spirit is self-control. And the secret of self-control is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And being filled with the Holy Spirit is is not evidence that you speak in tongues only, but that you walk in self-control. Now concerning brotherly love, ah, you have no need for anyone to write to you. This is the most intrinsic thing in receiving the love of God is to know that it's for others. You yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing and all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you brothers to do this more and more and to aspire, this is mama's verse, and to aspire to live a quiet life and mind your own business. You can hear I'm editing and work with your hands as we instructed you. so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. So in 1 Thessalonians, I want you to know what Paul teaches. He teaches personal independence financially and the care of those who can't take care of themselves. They're both there. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who sleep Say sleep. You know who the sleeping are? It's those who died. That you may not grieve as those who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For we declare this to you by the word from the Lord that we who are alive and who are left at the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. This is Paul saying to a group of people who don't yet know or understand what happens when you die, that those who have died in Christ are safe. And by the way, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is not about the rapture. It's about dying and rising from the dead. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, with the sound of the trumpet, and the dead in Christ will rise first. But what happens when he comes? Then we who are alive and left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so will we what? Will we what? So he says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. Uh, We turned those words into the greatest opportunity to scare people you could ever find. Just saying. Now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, I'm almost done. Have you figured out what I'm doing yet? I'm reading the Bible to you. With limited commentary. And I'm interested in it. (laughs) Because... Never mind. Now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, we have no need to write anything to you for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night while people are saying, there's peace and security. Then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you are not in the darkness. Well, that day to surprise you like a thief for you are all children of the light, children of the day. We are not of the night, nor are we of the darkness. So then, let us not sleep. And now sleep doesn't mean die. Now sleep means slumbering your way through life. So I've got to ask you today, are you sleepwalking through your life? Stop it. Wake up. Who are those that are sleepwalking through the light? Well, let's take a look. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. 
since we all belong to the day, let us be sober. Having put on the breastplate of faith and love for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. That means to say, if you know Jesus, your future is safe and secure. You're not destined for wrath. Hmm, it's an interesting thing. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might be with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. I didn't know I'd make it, but I did. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and who are over you and admonish you. Which is to say that when Paul came and started a church, listen to what it says now, don't miss it. He actually put some people over that business. And he said, there's some people that are over you. Now, the people who are over you don't consider themselves over you. They consider themselves alongside you. But you consider them to be over you. So you entreat somebody as a father or a mother and they treat you as a brother or a sister. That's how the ministry works. If you're in the ministry, you regard people as brothers and sisters. If you're, if you're not publicly in the, in the leadership of the ministry, you regard them as fathers and mothers. It's an honor thing. This thing works by honor. And he's teaching them to esteem them highly because of their work and be at peace among yourselves. We urge you, brothers, to admonish the idol. I'm always tempted to preach here. The death, I think the death of America is the death of personal responsibility. It's going to tell you. I think it's abandoning personal responsibility or dependency. Now, now, he, now he flips the thing. He, he'll flip the thing. He's already told us to have brotherly love. Now he says, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. So it goes like this. If somebody's idle, tell them off for crying out loud. Get up off your lazy can and go do something. Do it. My, I had a job when I was 10 years old. I did. I'm out of time. No. Admonish the idle. Encourage the faint-hearted. People, there's always somebody to encourage. Always, 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 always. If you go out in the world to encourage people, you're going to be in good shape. You got plenty to do. Help the weak. Now listen, help the weak. Listen, not everyone can take care of themselves. Help them. If you're not weak, the way I help you is to tell you to get up and help yourself. People ask me, how do I get in the ministry? I say, go get a job. <laughs> Start there. Take care of somebody else's business. God will put you over his business. Go get a job. See that no one repays. No, no, no. Wait, wait. Be patient with all of them. Patient. You want to see the one thing that's true in the Bible? It's the patience of God. He's never in a hurry. He says, we're going to do something. And 400 years later, we get started. <laughs> He's not in that big a hurry. He's not stressed out. God's not stressed out about it. See to it that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, not for all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. I've sure talked a lot about that. Come here Tuesday night. We, we promise to stir things up. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. I always know when I'm going through changes because I start getting a ton of prophecies and I hate most of them. 
and then I read the Bible. Do not despise prophecies. Okay, there's that. Yeah, I'm different from y'all. Y'all are all like, give me a word, give me a word, give me a word. I'm always like, shut up. <laughs> You've seen me, you know it. <laughs> My son came in last Sunday night. Dad, get up out of bed. I'm giving you a word. He gave me a word. Then he said, how do you want it delivered? You want it sung or said? And I'm like, I hate you. And then I got the word and it lifted me up and now I hated myself. Okay. Test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Stand together. Did you see what I did? Here's what I did. But, but before the ministry time comes the blessing. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord. He who calls you is faithful and he will surely do it. Now repeat after me. Now may the God of peace Sanctify me, Sanctify me. Completely. completely and may my whole spirit, soul, and body, spirit, soul, and body. be kept blameless, kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus. Faithful is the one who calls me. He will surely do it. Now amen yourself. Amen. Now, now, brothers and sisters, pray for us. Greet everyone with a holy kiss. And then here's what I read. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to everyone. And so I said, Lord, I'm going to test you. I'm going to tell the people the story of Thessalonica from your word. And then I'm going to read your word over the people with limited commercial interruption. <laughs> now, how many of you can say some of that word spoke to me very directly? God had a direct word for me. Now, listen, bind it to yourself. When I came to know the Lord, I opened the Bible. And I read the thing and I said, this thing reads like he's talking to me. That was 47 years ago. It still does. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. And now church, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Now we need a touch. Holy Spirit, would you come? We want change. And so for some of you, he's speaking to you about the call on your life. For some of you, he's speaking to you about imitating him before others. Some of you, he's speaking to you about morality, how to model it, how to have change in your life, how to help others get the change in their life. Some of you, he's speaking to you about your vocation and your devotion to your work. Some of you, he's, he's speaking to you about the ones you're grieving who have died and you're tethered to somebody who died and you can't get over it. And he says, no, 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 you got to lift up your head and live while you're living. But he's speaking to us. So if the Father is speaking to you this morning, would you, I want you to come for prayer. Come on, church. We're going to get touched by God this morning. That's right, Kat. Come on. That's right, Kelly, come on. We're gonna get touched by God this morning. That's right. That's right. Ministry team, don't come till I call you. I want the people to come first. Ryan, that's right. God's speaking to us about, about our future. He's speaking. He's speaking. 
He's speaking. I've never been more burdened for the culture than I am right now. Never in my life. But I've decided I'm not going to live under the power of the political spirit to deal with that, but under the power of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you.